Hello and welcome to The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. This was supposed to be a special on-location recording from the garden of G. N. Brandt in Gentofte, a suburb north of Copenhagen. And in fact, there is a recording. It will go down forever as one of the lost recordings, but it has a worrying crackle on the top. And I thought it probably best not to expose the listeners to to something so irritating. So instead, what you have are my impressions of G. N. Brandt's garden from my desk chair back at home on an overcast, cloud-scudding morning down here in Svenemollen by the beach. I hope you enjoy it. It was a wonderful garden to visit, and I think it has lessons that are applicable to spaces both large and small. So without further ado, let's take ourselves back in time to the early part of the 20th century and the arrival of the arts and crafts movement. I cycled up to Jim Brandt's garden. It took about 25 minutes on a beautifully overcast and low-skied afternoon. We have had the most brilliant blue and searing spring, which is exceptionally lovely if you are in charge of little children playing, as I sometimes am, or you are looking to go for a swim in the still cold sea as I have been doing. But I don't think it's fair to the spring flowers. I think that they need a little bit of grey around them occasionally to really show off their full effect. Think about the cherry blossom, that perfect pink, and how well it goes with the the modulated greys at the bottom of a cloud. They are colours in huge vogue, they have been for the last decade, soft grey and millennial pink made for each other. And they haven't had a chance to debut that that colour combination yet this season. The blossom season is short. It is a youthful fleeting time of the year. And it's a pity for these trees not to be able to show off their splendour against all variety of backdrops. Thus, I rejoiced in the greyness as I cycled up the coast. It's quite good, the cycle ride up there. It took me past Charlottenland and the old sea defences there. And there's a moat just in front of the the Orson there, in front of the sea, with huge reed beds, lovely tassely things. And I went past there a week or so ago, and it was just last year's reeds with their feathery flares at the top and a little tiny spikeling of green about their base. And this week the green rushes onwards. The green is up to their mid-thighs. By the end of next week it will be up to their shoulders, and then it will have swallowed them. Last year's blooms, last year's stems, will be all forgotten. It's an interesting time of year, that, that erasure of the russet tones of the old tones, the freshness of sap that is everywhere. I was reading about Revelius, Eric Revelius and Edward Borden and some of their theories about colour. And Revelius writes of Borden that he hated the onset of spring, loathed it, viewed it with profound, well, I wouldn't say horror, but verging on depression, because it meant that the green was going to rush up and cover everything, erase all the interest in the landscape with its pleasant newness. And I think you can see this. This is this is a kind of person who's in love with, with russet and cinnabar and all the colours of the ploughed field. If you look at one of his pictures like Waltham Cross, you see a man enthralled by the subtle depths of brown and beige, doing wonderful things with them. And I suppose for for a mindset like that, you could see this season 
as somewhat oppressive, somewhat obvious, somewhat in your face. This is a danger to those of us who are prone to getting obsessed with thinking, well, how would they see this view? How would they look at this particular thing? I had a, I had a time when I'd read, it's just one line, it's Flaubert's line in one of his diaries where he writes about the Alps and he says they have, this is the third time this week they've displeased me with their scale and size. They are all out of proportion. And <laughs> that is just such a fantastically idiosyncratic and odd way to look at the spectacle of a mountain that when I was in northern Italy, it was hard to think, well, these are, these are completely disproportionate. These aren't, these aren't to do with a, a golden ratio. Leonardo would never put these in any of his designs. It takes a while to shake it off and see that the splendour should be viewed through our own eyes alone. And that's the kind of thing you get when you read something like that by Borden. You start thinking, well, it is a shame that those reeds are disappearing. What a pity that I won't be able to look at the tone of drying mud, dry on the top of a furrow, still wet at the bottom. And of course, that's complete nonsense. I have a good bit of my book written about how much that sight, particularly in spring, depresses me. So I must be strong. I must be true to myself. I must not fall into the Borden trap. Anyway, no mud tones to be found in G.N. Brandt's garden, I'm glad to say. It's a very, very small garden, which I think is useful, it's instructive, because it's a look that could be created in any, well, not in any garden, not in most of our gardens, certainly not in my garden in, in Copenhagen or London, but for those lucky people who have the Vita Sackville West definition of a small garden, anything from a quarter of an acre to two acres. It is, it is perfect. Jane Brandt started working on it first in 1914, after coming back from some time in the UK, where I think he'd been hanging out with arts and craft exponents extraordinaire, William Robinson and Gertrude Jekyll. And some of their ideas have rubbed off on him. And this was the garden that he lived in until his death in 1945 didn't live in the garden, he had a house there, no longer standing. But this was the garden that he was using as his proving ground, as his experimental space to take and develop ideas to be trialled in the municipality of Gentofte, for which he was the man in charge of landscapes, and beyond, into the wider world of, of small castles and pleasure grounds that abounded in Denmark at the time. He's one of these great figures who seem happy to arrange the mowing schedule of the vergers on a Tuesday and go off to work for a minor aristocrat in setting out their, their lands on the Wednesday. It's also instructive because it has had no guiding presence for the last 70 years. The man himself is gone and is now under municipal control. And so it is interesting to see how structure survives when obviously the dedication to the individual plants, the dedication to the flower beds that is part of the arts and crafts calling card has slightly faded away, under-resourced and under-thought about. You really, really see how well the structure stands up when the, the colourful hay is removed. That's a great phrase that I, I came across this week. Russell Page writing about the planting in gardens. And he is he's a man for whom structure is all important and all plants are, are colourful hay. It's funny, this is how I've spent my life thinking about the colourful hay while greater minds than I go about with theodolites. Anyway, the garden is approached through a beech hedge, a simple black gate in a beech hedge. A very useful but exceptionally well thought about, considered and welcoming while still being private. It is welcoming because the hedge is in general two metres high, a continuation of that bordering the cemetery next door. 
but about three meters before it meets the gate, it slopes down in a slumping shoulder and then runs along at a very human four and a half a foot high, the height of the gate itself. And it does so on the other side, human height, then up gently in the shoulder and back to two meters, don't look in here height, which is a perfect way of saying, this is a place for you. This is a place where we want people to come. But the path beyond does not say, here, look into my bedroom. You're welcome to come and stare into my bathroom window. It curves gently. So you see a gate and a path and very mature shrubs leading to some mysterious beyond. Welcome to walk inside and find out for yourself, but nothing personal given away from the road. I liked it a lot. Immediately past the gate in this woodland walk, there are some quite good shrubs, a brilliantly scented single flowered cherry with that perfect almond hit. The kind of thing if you smelled it in your wine glass, you'd think someone's trying to cyanide me here. It is gloriously old and robbly bobbly and falling to pieces. Much more interesting in the olfactory sense than, than another huge cherry that stands there, which was double and pom-pom and completely perfumeless, but had its own value on this grey-skied, after-rained kind of day. It had shed a billion petals everywhere, enlivening the path and its grass verges, and the various little shrubs below. There was a, a euonymus, a spindle tree, self-seeded there, who was suddenly bedecked in this glorious, glorious crepe paper shroud of, of tissue blossom. It was as if an ordinary little creature, a little hedgehog, had suddenly stumbled into the, into the Rio Carnival and been showered in glitter and sequins for a moment. I very much enjoyed seeing that. There were other good shrubs in there as well, very old Persian ironwood with its flanks all dappled and stippled and camouflaged like, like the side of a tank. And on the other side, a huge, multi-stemmed hammermelis, very, very good hammermelis, hammermelis virginiana, the, the American one, which we don't see very often because it has the misfortune of flowering in mid to late autumn, when we've had a whole year of plants doing tricks. And we've seen spring and we've seen loads of tropical things in summer and then all the leaves have done all of that colouring, blah, blah, blah. And we just think, come on, let's do Christmas. I just want to drink and sit on the sofa. And then the American hammermollus goes, da-da, look what plants can do. And we say, we know we know what plants can do, mate. Come on. Whereas the hammermellus, mollus, the, the commonly seen one, which comes out in, in late Jan and Feb when we have forgotten that the world is alive and there are plants to see, delights us. Such a shame because the American, the, the, the Virginiano is so big as well, can be grown as a multi-stem, can be coppiced, can be a presence in the landscape in a way that the, the lovely as it is, little understory thing that is Hamamelis mollis never really can. finishes with another gate, a gloriously rustic, roundels of large, hammered onto a frame type of gate. If you pause there for a moment and turn left, you can see a really good clump of Tulipa sylvestris out in the woodland. Tulipa sylvestris is that glorious buttercup yellow tulip, sylvestris meaning of the woodland, that grows in fairly shaded conditions. And these were self-seeded, to my eye at least. If they weren't, then they have an exceptionally good naturalistic planter somewhere in their gardening stuff, because I can never get it quite right, even when I'm trying to do my best to, to imitate the seeds carried by, by wind and ant. I always somehow get a grid or a matrix. These were perfectly, perfectly random, i.e. planted 
badly by human standards, a lot of them too close together, and some of them in completely bizarre positions, which can only be done by, by the hand of chance and nature. So you can stop there and look at those for a second, or you can continue through and see two vast rockets of you, two cones as high as the gutter on an English house, even higher probably. And um, behind them is a beautifully unpruned, unkempt you. You see it between the two of them. And I wonder if it's a joke. I wonder if it is a very subtle gardener's little laughing nod to what the hand of man can do the fact that you can see such constraint and control and beyond it this just big explosion it's so funny that we think of you as such a tight clipped contorted blockish presence because we're used to seeing it as a structure and material when actually when you see it growing as a full-sized tree it's pretty sparse and scraggly it's not a canopy that has a shape as such, it has a series of branches always discernible from each other. Anyway, I strode between the majestic pillars to the area where the villa once would have stood. They've done a wonderful thing here. The villa was demolished in the 60s, but its outline remains in a single set of stones laid out where the boundary wall would have been, almost as if you were looking at an architect's draft of a house from complete bird's eye view. And it's useful because this is a domestic space and the garden has been set out in relationship to where the house would have been. And thus, no matter how nice the plants are, they are meaningless in design sense without thinking that here was the house. So I was very, very interested to see that. It's something that could be used perhaps in other places where the, the house has gone and the grounds remain. Perhaps you could set out a little, a little set of, of projector screens along the side of it and then maybe one day a year on Aunt Jean Brandt's birthday we could hologram his house in position and see what the whole place really would have looked like. It was very, very fragrant, this area. The, the scent of the most deliciously underplanted shrub. Underplanted in both senses, actually. Underplanted with vinca. There was a load of vinca scrambling around it. But underplanted in the sense of underused. We had to see it. And that's the Viburnum carlesii, which is an incredibly strongly scented plant. A little medium-sized shrub with, well, you'd call them white pom-pom heads, but they're not, they're not pom-pom heads in that viburnum opulus sense the flowers are much more visible much more waxy much more separate in their clumps more like in the in the viburnum bodnantense and they're not they're not beautiful they're not pristine they tend to brown pretty early and quickly and every single dome has some edward borden pleasing tones of of slightly bruised and rotten apple but the smell is magnificent. They're called the Korean spice bush. And so you sort of expect a little hint of clove and maybe cardamom and cinnamon. But I don't get any of that. I get pure sweetness and vanilla. It's the smell of a, a panna cotta. The smell of something wobbly and indulgent and utterly, utterly without nutrition. But just pure delight. And it filled that whole garden area, the space where there once was a house, was just fragrance. And there's a nicely placed bench there as well, so you could sit next to it and really hoon the whole thing in. Sitting on that bench, I was in a position that would have been G.M. Brandt's terrace, looking at the first of his garden rooms, the orchard room, now only lawn and two small trees, a little damsony green gauge thing, and a little apple thing. And between them, a path through a very, very well-clipped Lawsonia hedge, which drew me on into the next garden, a fantastically composed water garden. I will speak not of the edge plantings. They were not bad. In fact, they were good. They were full of 
this time of year's thuggish favourite, the, the ransom, the wild garlic, in bloom and beautiful. And beneath that, a bit of ground elder, and thrusting high above it all in an expanding cone, like uh, searchlights coming up from a, from a football stadium or Olympic stadium at the opening ceremony, were the brilliant bronze of the ostrich fern, hundreds and hundreds of ostrich ferns, in perfect late spring unfurling, that is when they are tall enough to give the shape, to give the, the shuttlecock skirt, but still with a little bit of uncoiling to do. So you have the brilliant bent over tip that looks like something scaly and fossilized, some little cephalopod from the from the mud of an ancient sea. A lot of those were planted under this real hobbly bobbly old apple tree with skin like the, the bubbly top of a lasagna you've put under the grill. All of those those sort of lumps and dumps on the top. But the main feature of the garden was a beautiful little canal. It was set in paving and I pasted out and made it about five paces to 15. So a three to one sort of area. And it consisted of a little, a little bit of water at the bottom, probably a foot and a half wide and then sloping banks covered in beautiful boggish things. The great big straight up spikes of the, the umbrella plant, you know the one, the, the uh, Dimera pilata, which is a sight to see. It's only, on getting quite close, I think you realise, that's Saxifragaceae. That's in the wheelhouse of, of London Pride. And it is. It's a vast, great big saxifrage sending up its flower spike before the huge leaves come. Bold planting for what is quite a small area. In the, the rest of this slopey, muddy gully, there's lots of marsh marigold. Marsh marigold, terrible misnomer of a common name because, of course, it's a marsh buttercup. That, that beautiful round leafed and shining flowered thing with all the metallic reflective qualities of the butterfly of the field just bigger and there were the young youthful frosting strands of flag iris in there which are going to look fantastic later in the year i absolutely adore flag iris with those very very short-lived but brilliant pure yellow flowers that unfurl in something like a millisecond. They're all twisted together at the top like um, like one of those little paper explosive things. You know the things you get where you, where you throw them to the ground and they go pop and cover the floor in bits of grit and gunpowder. They are twisted like that and as the pressure builds lower in the flower it tugs and tugs and tugs at this knot until it comes undone in a second and the whole thing springs open into full flower where there was not one before. It's another thing that I, I write about in the book so it's, it's still fresh in my mind. Anyway that was there along with that shimmery almost glaucous. It's strange isn't it? it the, the leaf of the hemerocallus I'm talking about. Almost glaucous leaf of the hemerocallus because it isn't pure glaucus, it's not a eucalyptus gunnii type blue, matty blue, but it looks like a plant that is green like the flag iris that had been painted with a, with a shimmer of blue, that has had some sort of extravagant party eye shadow smeared onto it with an enthusiastic thumb. Great little leaves. I found this garden exceptionally well proportioned both in size of the overall rectangle and in the size of the canal garden itself. It was a cooling calming presence and so striking geometrically that it didn't really need the planting around the edges which I fear has fallen away a little bit from from what it might have been in, in GM Brandt's time. I could have stayed there for quite a long time listening to the perfect dribble of water. Certainly not a fountain, not a gush. This was the, the merest trickle, as if a washer had perished somewhere within the workings of the garden, and it, it felt right for that kind of space. I could have lingered there for a very long time, and indeed I did, but we can't have that dead air on this podcast. So I think we should progress through the, the next gap in the next hedge, 
and into the last garden, the woodland garden. The woodland garden was small and suffering, I think, not at its best. I'm loath to be negative about anything in the gardening world. And I've had this actually from very, very early in my career. I wrote a thing for the Telegraph and criticised a piece of planting and got really told off by someone who knew the people involved and how hard they tried and how lovely they were. And I felt very awful about it and it does knock into my head occasionally well maybe we do need more criticism in gardens but it's a it's a thankless slope to to tumble down and then you end up sounding like there's this oh i won't go into it you won't (laughs) some people will know who you end up sounding like so i generally steer clear but here it is not a question of poor maintenance or poor decision making or neglect it's a more deep and profound question than that it's the question of how should a garden be kept a garden that is living 60 70 100 200 years beyond the life of its creator should we keep things because they have been touched by the hand of the great man or woman themselves Or should we honour their vision and replace them with the plants that they would have recognised? I talk about this in the context of two or three vast beech trees in the middle that obviously had once been kept fairly close and clipped because they branch at about the height of your bottom if you wanted to lean gently against uh, a tree you could do so at the branching point of these trees but they have grown thick and high above this and obviously in Brandt's day they would have been much smaller and much more constrained and they dominate the place slightly not to say that there aren't very very good plantings still there lots of f medium cut back so you can see the flowers those little waxy caps and some geranium fame in dark maroon and the spotting on the leaves and martigan lilies everywhere not out but in their ruffs they have that wonderful way of growing its stem and then full spiky collar like you get on the the neck of that dinosaur the one in jurassic park that that spits venom so effectively and then up a stem a bit and then another dinosaur ruff and then the top the nodding head and in this case a complete orgy of copulating lily beetles looking bright and shiny like like magical beetles in an illustrated fairy tale book i don't think they'll do too much damage to these lilies yet because they were very big and and vigorous things despite their woodland covering it felt too woodlandy it didn't feel like a space where one would really want to sit with with a book or a newspaper so I don't know I don't know if that might have been a problem if you were thinking about applying this method to to your own garden where space is precious I left that room and entered an exceptionally austere geometric space of grass and hedges a very 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 long thin rectangle If we imagine these three garden rooms, the one with the beautiful scent, the one with the dribbling water, and the one with the the shaded lilies, as bedrooms in a bungalow, then this was the corridor from which you would enter them, except there were no entry points into the, the middle or first garden. It was just a return to the front door. And I thought it was very useful. I thought it was calming. Often garden rooms particularly mature garden rooms particularly garden rooms of plants people who want to stuff their borders can somehow feel claustrophobic can feel a bit cloying and too much a bit labyrinthine 
and almost panicked by the end of them. And this was a mental cleanse. This was a bit of Italian freshness, a relief. I can imagine Brandt going there after dealing with some crisis in the trees and perennials or the staff rotors of his garden and just wanting to not worry about weeding and herbaceous stuff. A space Mary Kondo given over to a pure, uncluttered life. Only the essentials of the garden there. The grass, the hedge, the sky. And that was it. My tour of the garden complete. I hope you enjoyed this retrospective on yesterday's trip. I really must do something about that crackle. It's very annoying. I think I'm going to have to buy a different little outside recorder. Something that I can monitor a little bit better. And that maybe doesn't have a long microphone cable. Maybe I should talk to some audio experts. Anyway, that's something that's something for me to consider. I do hope you enjoyed listening to this today. If you did, then you could consider contributing to the Garden Logs funds for, for hosting and potential microphones and other things by going to ko-fi.com or coffee.com. You can find that at ko-fi.com slash bendark, all one word. Or of course, you can buy my book. Non-financial contributions can take the form of sending me an email, sending me some nice words about how you have enjoyed the podcast, or telling other people, even better, telling them online or in person, going forth digitally and corporeally, being, a, being an evangelist for the Garden Log. Hopefully I will see you and all of your new converts here in the same place next week when we'll be doing another week in gardening and answering some horticultural correspondence. I hope you have a wonderful week, whether you're in your own garden or someone else's. Thank you for listening and goodbye.